There are a lot of Batman movies. Like, however many you think there are, it's way more than that. And I watched every single one of them. So we all know who Batman is, right? Most popular superhero of all time, beats up criminals dressed like a bat, dead parents, all that stuff. Batman is pretty inescapable, especially nowadays when superhero movies dominate the box office. I'm sure every single one of you have seen at least part of one Batman movie or TV show. Earlier this year, I thought to myself, hey, I like Batman. I've seen a decent amount of Batman stuff. What if I watched all the Batman movies I had never seen, you know, be a completionist about it? That turned out to be a much larger ordeal than I thought it would be. And not just because there are a lot of movies. There's so much Batman stuff out there that it's hard to even know if you've seen it all. There are very few complete lists of movies out there, and the criteria for what counts as a Batman movie can vary. And also, some of them connect to each other in ways that aren't always obvious. I didn't just sit in front of the TV for three months, this video took research. But, I did it. I found and watched every single one. Now I can put out this video so that anybody who's interested has a complete guide right here for all the stuff that's out there. Over the course of this video, I'll be listing every Batman movie, along with a short review of it and explain how it fits in with the collection as a whole. And other than a few clips here and there, this video is completely spoiler free. First, a clarification of terms, because the phrase Batman movie isn't nearly specific enough. I tried to make my criteria as broad as possible, but I still have to draw the line somewhere. My definition of a Batman movie is 1. It's a feature length film, meaning it's at least 40 minutes long. And I'm also excluding individual episodes of a Batman TV show that exceed 40 minutes. 2. It's officially licensed by DC, so no fan films and no references to Batman from other studios. 3. It includes Batman, or shares continuity with another piece of media that includes Batman. It doesn't matter how briefly Batman appears, if he's part of the story in any way, that movie goes on the list. Oh, and one final disclaimer. I don't read comics. I've never read a Batman comic, and I only know what other people have told me and what I've learned in my research. So I'm not coming at this from a perspective of a comic fan. With those parameters set, let's get started. I'll start with the live-action movies and go mostly in release order. Then I'll move on to the animated ones after. The first ever Batman movie is from 1966, called Batman the Movie. This was what started it all, what brought Batman from niche comic book character into the mainstream culture. This movie is part of the 60s Batman TV show, and it starred Adam West as Batman and Burt Ward as Robin. If you've never heard of this one, you might know it as the one where Batman has a shark repellent in his utility belt. Hand me down the shark repellent bat spray! It is unlike any other movie on this list. It doesn't take itself seriously at all. The campiness is turned up to 11 and it is so funny. Like laugh out loud in every scene funny. I highly highly recommend it, even if you hate superhero stuff. Here we have the longest gap in between movies by far. There wasn't another Batman movie until 1989 with Batman, directed by Tim Burton. It starred Michael Keaton as Batman, facing off against Jack Nicholson as the Joker. Its sequel, Batman Returns, featured Danny DeVito as the Penguin and Michelle Pfeiffer as Catwoman. To a modern audience, these are really interesting as cultural artifacts. The tone is more similar to the Batman of today. They're Tim Burton movies, of course they're going to be dark and creepy. But you can tell Hollywood hadn't figured out quite how to make superhero movies work yet. The story is played straight, but everything looks and feels kind of goofy at the same time. Plus they took a lot of liberties with the Batman mythos. Batman has no problems with killing people, and the Joker gets a full origin story. These movies are a good first attempt, but overall I don't think they hold up very well. Next came the movies directed by Joel Schumacher, Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. Batman Forever stars Val Kilmer as Batman, Jim Carrey as the Riddler, and Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face. Batman Forever features a Robin origin story, where Robin is played by Chris O'Donnell. 
O'Donnell reprises his role in Batman and Robin, but here George Clooney plays Batman, along with Arnold Schwarzenegger as Mr. Freeze and Uma Thurman as Poison Ivy. Tonally, these are the exact opposite of the Burton movies. They lean hard into campiness territory, but it's nowhere near as effective as in the Adam West days, and these movies are both widely disliked. Of the two, Batman Forever is the better one, but I wouldn't recommend either of them. They don't have a good story, and they're not really funny either. At best, they might be good to watch drunk with a bunch of friends. Some people might group these movies together, calling all four of them part of the same series. But I don't know, it depends on how you look at it. Obviously, Batman and Batman Returns are a pair, but looking at all four of them, they share the same actor for Alfred and for Commissioner Gordon, but that's it. There are no story threads that connect them. Even between the Schumacher movies, the only things that carry over between the two are the visual style and Chris O'Donnell's Robin. It's very clear that nobody was thinking about continuity when these movies were being made. Can I persuade you to take a sandwich with you, sir? I'll get drive through. Next came Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, starring Christian Bale as Batman. I won't spend too much time on them, since pretty much everybody knows about them. Batman Begins shows Batman training to become Batman under Ra's al Ghul, played by Liam Neeson. In The Dark Knight, he battles Heath Ledger's Joker, and The Dark Knight Rises has Tom Hardy as Bane. All three are dark, gritty, and not very comic booky. They're very well made, and they were huge critical and commercial successes. And then we get to the more recent era of live-action Batman. After Marvel had such huge success with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, DC, not wanting to be outdone, made one of their own. The DC Extended Universe, or DCEU for short. And here it is. These are all the movies that are part of this continuity. It starts with Man of Steel, a Superman movie. Then the second movie, Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice, wow that's a mouthful, introduces Ben Affleck as Batman. After that was Suicide Squad. It's about a bunch of Batman villains, but Batman himself only gets a small cameo. Then we get Wonder Woman, and then Justice League. This is the big superhero team-up movie, with Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg. This is way different than how the Avengers did it though. The Marvel movies had solo movies for each major character, and then made the crossover team-up. But in Justice League, this is the first time we're seeing half these characters. I'll list the last few real quick since Batman doesn't appear in any of them. Aquaman, Shazam, Birds of Prey, that's a sequel to Suicide Squad by Harley Quinn, and Wonder Woman 1984. In general though, these movies have not been well received. Some people didn't click with the dark, gritty, mature tone that a lot of them have, and a lot of people complain that the overall story feels messy. It's not meticulously planned out like the Marvel movies are. Some people love them, but other than Wonder Woman and Shazam, the public opinion of these movies is low. There's one more thing about the DCEU that I absolutely have to mention. Justice League, the Snyder Cut. If you're out of the loop, here's what this is. So Zack Snyder is the guy who directed Man of Steel and Batman v Superman. He was the original director for Justice League too, but there were shenanigans behind the scenes and he had to drop out. His replacement, Joss Whedon, finished up the movie making a lot of changes in the process. The final product, like any movie that switches directors halfway through, feels kind of messy and cobbled together. A rumor got started that somewhere there existed a completed cut of the movie that Snyder had finished, so fans started a grassroots internet campaign to release the Snyder Cut, which gained a huge amount of traction. And then DC actually did it. They brought Zack Snyder back to reshoot a bunch of scenes, re-edit them together, and then they released Zack Snyder's Justice League as a four-hour movie on HBO Max. It's This whole thing is absolutely fascinating. Nothing like this has ever been done. Two versions of the exact same movie by two different directors. I will say, after watching it, it is definitely better than the theatrical release. But if he hated Batman v Superman, he probably won't like this much either. Finally, we have Joker, starring Joaquin Phoenix. You know, this almost doesn't qualify as a Batman movie. But we do get a scene with young Bruce Wayne in here, so I think it counts. But forget Batman, this barely even counts as a DC movie. The Joker in this movie bears almost no resemblance to the supervillain we're familiar with. If you swapped out the names Joker, Gotham, and Wayne, this is a totally original story, with a comic book coat of paint to attract Batman fans. And that's every live-action Batman movie. Now it's time for... So obviously, the live-action movies are the best-known Batman stuff. They're the ones that get released in theaters, and they're the ones that non-comic book fans will actually watch. But you might not have realized the sheer breadth of animated Batman movies. DC has been cranking these out at an insane pace for the last 30 years. And since most of them are direct to video, they fly mostly under the radar. Some are mediocre, some are pretty good, and some are criminally underrated. We start with the DC Animated Universe, also known as the Timverse. 
named after executive producer Bruce Timm. This is a group of animated TV shows and movies in the 90s and early 2000s that all exist in the same continuity. It starts with Batman the Animated Series. And I know that this video is supposed to be just movies, but I can't not talk about this show. As far as I and a lot of other people are concerned, this is the definitive Batman. It perfectly strikes the balance between dark and brooding and fun and family friendly. It influenced every single Batman that came after it. And it introduced us to the voice of Kevin Conroy as Batman and Mark Hamill as the Joker. I am Batman! <laughs> the first ever animated Batman movie was Batman Bask of the Phantasm. And boy did they start off with a bang. It's basically an extended episode of the animated series, and everything I said about the show also applies here. But in addition, it has the most compelling portrayal of Bruce Wayne out of anything else on this list by far. Like sometimes Batman can be flat and stoic, but here he's a real character. I know I made a promise, but I didn't see this coming. I didn't count on being happy. The second movie that ties into the animated series is Batman and Mr. Freeze Sub-Zero. This is also basically just a longer episode of the show. It's as good as the show, and Mr. Freeze is probably the most sympathetic Batman villain there is. Okay, before I move on, I need to do a quick tangent on the different versions of Robin. It's relevant to a bunch of the other movies, and it'll make talking about them easier if you have this background info. So, Dick Grayson is the original Robin. He's the one who's been in all the movies mentioned so far. But Dick Grayson eventually grows up and breaks away from Batman to become Nightwing. The second Robin is Jason Todd. But Jason Todd gets captured, tortured, and killed by the Joker, and then he gets brought back to life as the villain slash anti-hero the Red Hood. The third Robin is named Tim Drake, who also goes by the name Red Robin. Yum. Finally, the fourth Robin is Damian Wayne. The first three were all orphans that Bruce Wayne adopted, but Damian is Bruce's biological son with Talia al Ghul. She's the daughter of Ra's al Ghul, that lady from The Dark Knight Rises. This is the progression that happens in the comics, but different movie versions of Batman have one or more of these Robins. With that out of the way, back to the Timverse. Batman the Animated Series was followed by The New Batman Adventures, a sequel series that changed up the art style and tone a bit. Dick Grayson is now Nightwing, and Tim Drake is the new Robin. The New Batman Adventures had one movie tie-in, Mystery of the Batwoman. Alongside the Batman shows, there was also Superman the Animated Series, Static Shock, The Zeta Project, Justice League, and Justice League Unlimited. All these shows have various crossovers with each other, but the only other TV show to get a feature-length film with it is Batman Beyond. This show is about a cyberpunk future Gotham, where an elderly Bruce Wayne is training a new guy, Terry McGinnis, to become the next Batman. Its movie, Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, is one of the best. I can't get into why without spoilers, but this is a very strong one. You can watch this as a standalone, but it brings in a lot of lore from the Timverse, and it's better if you watch the Batman TV shows first. The Timverse ended in 2006, but some years later, we got two more movies to add to the collection. Batman and Harley Quinn, a continuation of Batman the Animated Series, and Justice League vs. The Fatal Five, a continuation of Justice League Unlimited. It might be more accurate to say that these are more spiritual successors than direct continuations, though. They're more about recapturing the art style and tone than continuity. Next, I'll touch on any animated movies that tie in with live-action films. The Adam West version of Batman appeared in some animated stuff back in the day, like the Super Friends TV show and the short-lived The New Adventures of Batman, but no movies until 50 years later, with Batman Return of the Cape Crusaders. This is a revival of the old live-action show, with a lot of the old cast back to do the voices. The year after, a sequel came out, Batman vs. Two-Face, with William Shatner as Two-Face. This version of Batman isn't quite as funny as he is in live-action, but they're good for nostalgia's sake. The other live-action tie-in is Batman Gotham Knight. It's an anime-style anthology movie set within the Nolan movie universe. At least that's what Google tells me, you would never know that by watching it. It's really its own thing. Next, I'll go over the standalone animated Batman movies. Most of these came out in the late 2000s and are based on specific graphic novels, and don't really connect to any other movie on the list. First, Batman Under the Red Hood. This movie tells the story of Jason Todd dying and coming back as the Red Hood, like I explained earlier. This is a very good one. If you're going to do a dark and mature Batman story, this is the movie you should model it on. Alongside this movie is Batman Death in the Family, but this is not its own movie. It's just Under the Red Hood again, as in the exact same footage recut to make an interactive choose-your-own-adventure movie on Blu-ray. And if you watch it on HBO Max, the branching path stuff is all missing, so it's just a half-hour recap of Under the Red Hood. 
Batman Year One follows Bruce Wayne's first year as Batman, alongside Jim Gordon's first year as a cop in Gotham. Another very strong entry, and the most mature story so far. Then, The Dark Knight Returns, Parts 1 and 2. This takes place years in the future, when an aging Bruce Wayne comes out of retirement to be Batman one last time. There's a ton of new and unique stuff in this one, like Carrie Kelly as Robin, the only time he got a Robin on screen other than the core four that I already mentioned. You can see how Batman v Superman pulled a ton of influence from this version of old grizzled Batman. This is a great one, and if you're a seasoned Batman fan, you'll love it. Next, Batman the Killing Joke. This might be the most high-profile, non-theatrically released Batman movie. It made a reasonably large splash on the internet when it came out in 2016. It serves as a Joker origin story. It's kind of a mixed bag. It's by far the most adult movie on this entire list. Maybe a little too adult. The extreme nature of the story was a turnoff for a lot of viewers. Seeing Joker as a regular guy before he went crazy is pretty cool though. Batman Ninja This is an anime movie that has the entire Batman cast of characters transported from Gotham to feudal Japan. It is so much fun, and completely balls to the wall insane. The story is paper thin, but the whole thing oozes with style. I love it. Closing out this category is Batman Soul of the Dragon. This is the newest Batman movie, coming out in early 2021. It's a tribute to 70s martial arts films. It's barely a Batman movie though. It's more like a kung fu movie with a character who happens to be named Bruce Wayne. Moving away from movies just about Batman, this next section is, uh, I'll call it miscellaneous Justice League movies. These are movies that feature Batman as part of an ensemble, and that don't connect to any other movies. With any Justice League movie, you can count on seeing Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, The Flash, and Green Lantern. They're the core five who are always there. Other characters who pop up a lot of the time are Martian Manhunter, Aquaman, Cyborg, Hawkman and Hawkgirl, Captain Adam, and Shazam. First, Justice League The New Frontier. This brings all the DC superheroes back to the 1950s, inserting them into the Cold War and the Red Scare. There are a pair of movies in this Superman-Batman series, Public Enemies and Apocalypse. Public Enemies has Superman and Batman on the run from the government after Lex Luthor is elected president. Apocalypse has them fighting the biggest bad guy of the DC canon, Darkseid. These movies are maybe misnamed though. These are really Superman movies. Superman is the main character and Batman is a glorified sidekick. Then there's Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. In this one, the Justice League travels to a parallel universe where they fight evil versions of themselves. Alright, the premise sounds super corny, but this is actually one of the most creative and interesting movies on the list. Paired with that is Justice League Doom, which I guess is a sequel, but who can even tell? It's got the same art style and same voice actors, and it's about a group of villains who discover all the Justice League's weaknesses. Justice League Gods and Monsters is an alternate version of the Justice League where Superman is the son of General Zod, Batman is a literal vampire, and Wonder Woman is a killer space princess. They're not evil per se, just morally grey. It reminds me a lot of Amazon Prime's The Boys. JLA Adventures Trapped in Time is the last one for this little group. It's a throwback to the old school Super Friends cartoon. And it's for little kids, an adult won't get anything out of this. Now we get to the really interesting stuff. Between 2013 and 2020, DC released 16 animated movies, all part of the same continuity. The DC Animated Movie Universe, or DCAMU. Here is every single movie in that series. Yeah, I know, it's huge. It's almost as many movies as the Marvel Universe had at the time. If you found the live-action DC Universe lacking, you might find a lot to like here. I'll quickly touch on each movie and then talk about the whole thing. The first movie in the series is The Flashpoint Paradox. A weird one to start with, I know. It's a classic story from the comics, where Flash goes back in time to save his mom and accidentally rewrites history. It's a really great movie, but it might be a lot to take in if you're not familiar with most DC properties. It does next to nothing to ease new viewers into this universe. Justice League War is a sort of prequel to Flashpoint, about the Justice League meeting for the first time and teaming up to stop Darkseid's invasion of Earth. The first Batman-focused movie is Son of Batman. This is the first movie that gave us Damian Wayne as Robin. Damien was raised by Ra's al Ghul in the League of Assassins, so he's a super smart, trained killer. When he teams up with Batman, he chafes against Batman's whole no-killing rule. Damien is kind of the main character of this whole universe, and his relationship with Batman gets a ton of great development across multiple movies. Justice League Throne of Atlantis is an Aquaman origin story. 
It's basically the same plot as the live-action Aquaman, but with the rest of the Justice League also there off to the side. Batman vs. Robin is the sequel to Son of Batman, which has a secret cult called the Court of Owls, tempting Damien to betray Batman. Uh, spoiler alert, I guess, but he doesn't. The last movie in the Damien Wayne trilogy is Batman Bad Blood. Batman goes missing, and Damien, Nightwing, Batwoman, and Batwing team up to find him. In Justice League vs. the Teen Titans, Damien gets sent to join the Teen Titans. If you grew up with the Teen Titans cartoon, you'll probably be really into this more mature take. It's almost the same roster, except since Cyborg is already in the Justice League in this universe, they have Blue Beetle instead. Justice League Dark has Batman assembling a team of people with supernatural powers to fight demons and stuff. Batman himself is a very small part of the story, though. Really, this is a movie about John Constantine, the Demon Hunter. It helps set up his spin-off, Constantine City of Demons. Teen Titans The Judas Contract is another Teen Titans movie, about Terra joining the team, another storyline that fans of the cartoon might know. Suicide Squad Hell to Pay is a Suicide Squad movie. It's a similar plot to the live-action movie, but way better, and with a slightly different roster. Death of Superman and Reign of the Superman are about, uh, Death of Superman, and its aftermath. The final Batman-focused movie in the series is Batman Hush. It's somewhat separate from the Damian Wayne movies. Batman and Catwoman face off against a deadly new enemy, Hush. This is a cool one because it has almost every major Batman character, good and bad, pop up at some point. Although the ending... You know what, I might save my thoughts about the ending for another time. Then there's Wonder Woman Bloodlines, a Wonder Woman solo movie. And the DCAMU ends with Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. I won't say much about it because of spoilers, but this is a big crossover ending a lot like Endgame, but a lot darker and more violent. And with that, the DC animated movie universe is over. So watching it as a whole, what's the experience like? First, it's not the kind of thing that holds your hand. I mean, the story isn't complicated, but it assumes you have basic knowledge of DC properties beforehand. Like, it starts with the Flashpoint Paradox, of which the entire premise is taking stuff you've seen before and scrambling them around. As for the crossovers and continuity, compared to something like the Marvel movies, these are not so intricately connected. Direct references to other movies are very uncommon, and you could watch most of these movies by themselves without being too confused. But the consistency of the art style, voice acting, and writing, combined with some intersecting plot points, make this a fun thing to watch all in a row. That's it for the DCAMU. But alongside these, there are also two more movies that kinda go with this group. They have the same animation style, but they're about what-if scenarios of different DC characters. The first is Batman Gotham by Gaslight, which has Batman fighting crime in the 1800s. The second is Superman Red Sun, which imagines a world where baby Superman crashed in Soviet Russia instead of Kansas, and Batman appears briefly as a terrorist trying to bring Superman down. Are we close to done? No, not at all. The next section is all movies tied to a TV show other than the Timverse. First up is The Batman vs. Dracula, part of the 2004 show The Batman. Because why not make a movie where the two most famous Bat-themed characters duke it out? Next, Teen Titans movies. It took me a while to figure out, does Teen Titans Trouble in Tokyo belong on this list? Because Robin's in it, he's the leader of the Titans, but no Batman. But this is connected to the 2003 Teen Titans cartoon, which I already mentioned. And Batman appears very briefly in one scene of one episode as a hallucination of Robins. So screw it, I'm counting it. The original Teen Titans cartoon was so great. And this movie is just as good. I know a lot of people my age have a ton of nostalgia for it. Next is Teen Titans Go to the movies. The movie for the Teen Titans reboot series, Teen Titans Go. Now, a lot of people who grew up watching the original show really hate Teen Titans Go on principle. You ruined my childhood! And I get it. The original Teen Titans had great balance between serious and silly, and it never talked down to its audience. To make a reboot that's pretty much all comedy feels like a betrayal of what makes the first show so good. But to my fellow 2003 kids, I say, give this movie a chance. It's unironically really funny. As in, I laughed out loud multiple times. Plus, the characters are surprisingly faithful to the old show. And on top of that, I think this movie is a more effective satire of the superhero movie genre than Deadpool. It's absolutely worth watching. But if you're really stuck on the original Teen Titans show, there's still Teen Titans Go vs. Teen Titans, the crossover that brings both versions together. And there's even a cameo by the DCAMU Teen Titans. It's not technically a TV show, but Batman Assault on Arkham is a prequel movie to the Batman Arkham video games. Not that you could tell by watching it, it stands on its own no problem. Make no mistake though, Batman's name may be in the title, but this is a Suicide Squad movie. Batman's just a background character, really. If you like the live-action movie or Hell to Pay, you'll like this. 
There are three movies that are part of the Batman Unlimited series, Animal Instincts, Monster Mayhem, and Mechs vs. Mutants. The show and the movies were created to promote the Batman Unlimited toy line. These movies are not very good. They're 80% action, they're basically hour-long toy commercials. These are the only movies on the list that I would say do not watch, even if you love all things Batman. Batman had lots of crossovers with Scooby-Doo back in the day, with the new adventures of Scooby-Doo. But there wasn't anything feature length until Scooby-Doo and Batman the Brave and the Bold, a crossover with the Batman the Brave and the Bold TV show. This is easily the campiest version of Batman since the Adam West days, so it's perfect to mix with Scooby-Doo. Scooby, turn left, left, got it. He doesn't know directions. Duh, he's a dog. Another crossover to note is Batman vs. the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Although this isn't any particular incarnation of either Batman or the Turtles. It's pretty much exactly what you would expect. Michelangelo skateboards around the Batcave, Batman says cowabunga, it's just a rockin' good time. With DC Superheroes vs. Eagle Talon, things get a little messy. Eagle Talon is a Japanese cartoon about a team of supervillains. It's irreverent and cheaply made, kinda like South Park. And unfortunately, here's where I have to admit that I lied. I didn't watch every Batman movie, at least not in its entirety. This crossover movie with DC isn't available in the West. I was only able to find bits and pieces of it online, mostly without English subtitles. So for the parts of it that I did see, I had no idea what I was looking at. From what I saw though, and from what I researched, this movie is absolutely insane. And also, I cut myself a break and didn't even try to watch the four other Eagle Town movies. I hope you all can forgive me. The last TV show to cover is... DC Superhero Girls. It was at this point that I began questioning all of my life choices. But I came this far, and I couldn't stop now. So I, a grown man, sat down and watched three movies made for 10-year-old girls. Hero of the Year, Intergalactic Games, and Legends of Atlantis. There's also a 45 minute TV special that I'm not counting. The show is about a bunch of mostly female DC characters who attend Superhero High. I don't want to bash these too hard since they're obviously not made for me. Just know that unless you're a little girl, there's nothing here for you. It took me a while to figure out if these even count. Like, Batgirl is a major character, but not Batman. Does that count? I wasn't sure. So I dug deeper. It turns out there are two different iterations of the show. The newer reboot does have Batman, but the older one does not. And all three of these movies are part of the older one. But I finally dug up one episode where Batman is mentioned one time. That father believes I need a sitter? Insulting. I was raised by the League of Assassins, trained by the fiercest warriors. I don't need some inept fool tending to me as if I were a common brat. So I can definitively say that they count as Batman movies. We're almost at the end. The only ones left are the Lego movies. We have the Lego movie and the Lego movie 2, the second part, where Batman is a major character. He's basically a parody of himself. Emmett, this is my boyfriend, Batman. I'm Batman. And of course, the Lego Batman movie. It's a great parody of all the Batman stuff that came before it, and it's very funny. <gasps> Batman? Whoa! You're darn right, whoa. Wait, does Batman live in Bruce Wayne's basement? No, Bruce Wayne lives in Batman's attic. Are we done? Nope. We still have 11 Lego DC movies to cover. The first, Batman the Movie DC Super Heroes Unite, is a compilation of cutscenes from the LEGO Batman video game. The rest are your standard LEGO TV movie affair. Justice League vs. Bizarro League, Justice League Attack of the Legion of Doom, Justice League Gotham City Breakout, Justice League Cosmic Clash, The Flash, Aquaman Rage of Atlantis, Batman Family Matters, and Shazam Magic and Monsters. Oh, and also there are two movies of LEGO DC Superhero Girls, Brain Drain and Supervillain High. If you've seen, like, any of the LEGO Star Wars movies, or played any of the newer LEGO video games, you'll know exactly what to expect here. Goofy cartoons for kids with lots of franchise meta-commentary. But how? Quite simple, really. You uncannily anticipated my every move as you fled. I simply anticipated you anticipating my every move and adjusted accordingly, beating you to the place I would have chased you to. And real quick, here are a few movies that didn't quite make the cut but that I think are worth mentioning. The Halle Berry Catwoman movie. It bears almost no resemblance to the Batman villain, and Batman isn't in it. The less said about it, the better. The Batman serials from the 1940s. They aren't feature length, but this is the first time Batman ever appeared on film. 
the various timbrous movies. None of these are actually movies. They're multi-part episodes of different Timverse TV shows that were edited together and released on VHS. Batman Dracula. This is the copyright infringing 60s art film by Andy Warhol. Yes, this really exists. It's mostly lost to time, but clips of it are on YouTube. Batman is referenced in Ready Player One for like three seconds. You can climb Mount Everest with Batman. And Holy Musical Batman. This is a parody musical by Team Star Kid on YouTube. Not a movie, but if you like Batman, you'll think it's hilarious. And that's it. That's every Batman movie ever made. After a final count, the grand total stands at 89 movies. <sighs> that's a long time. But now, I can call myself a Batman expert. I know more about Batman than anyone, except for the people who watch all the TV shows and read the comics, but yeah, Batman expert. So after watching all these movies, what are my takeaways? Which ones are the best? and what have I learned about the Batman franchise as a whole. First, there are very few actively bad Batman movies. There are plenty of mediocre ones, but even the worst ones have at least some mindless entertainment value. Part of the reason of why so few of them really tank, I think, is because it's really hard to mess up Batman as a character. He's not very complex. Basically, he's dark, overly serious, and hyper-competent at everything. He hardly ever shows emotion. This makes him super cool and fun to watch in any context, but the trade-off is that he's really hard to relate to or empathize with. Inevitably, in most movies it's the villains that are the most interesting characters. And boy does Batman have the best rogues gallery ever. It was an absolute treat to see so many different interpretations of the Joker, all of them good. The Riddler, Harley Quinn, and Clayface are my other personal favorites. By the way, Poison Ivy? Either she's aged terribly or really well, I can't decide. Her whole thing is that she's trying to stop greedy billionaires from polluting the environment, and I'm supposed to root against her? I have here a proposal showing how Wayne Enterprises can immediately cease all actions that toxify our environment. Well, your intentions are noble, but no diesel fuel for heat, no coolants to preserve food. Millions of people would die of cold and hunger alone. Acceptable losses in the battle to save the planet? People come first, Dr. Eisen. Wow, that's an exchange that could only come out of 1997. Moving to the broader DC movies, Batman as part of the Justice League is almost a completely different character from Batman by himself. In any superhero team-up movie, the stakes are always way higher. It's really funny to see the writers struggle to justify why a guy with no powers can hold his own against multidimensional alien gods. They make it work by making Batman basically know everything, so he can outwit any enemy. It's pretty silly. Besides that though, I enjoyed the team-up movies a lot more than I thought I would. I didn't know much about the non-Batman properties going in, but by the end I had a fun time seeing the same characters pop up over and over in different iterations. Like I got to the point where I'd see a middle-aged black guy in a lab coat and instantly go, oh, that must be Silas Stone, head of Star Labs and the father of Victor Stone aka Cyborg. Will he just be a background character here or will they get into his complicated relationship with his son? The most notable and unexpected thing that I noticed though was how few of these movies are for kids. You usually think of superhero stuff as for the whole family, but there are very few of these that I would feel comfortable showing to like a 9 year old. Most of them are PG-13, and a lot of them are rated R. There's cursing, sex, and graphic violence across the board. You can see a general trend with this over time too. Since the 90s there's been an exponential increase in Batman movies. That's no surprise since superheroes have grown to dominate the film industry. But as time went on, the percentage of Batman movies for kids went way down. The Timverse was for kids, and some of the earliest live-action movies could be enjoyed by the whole family, but since 2005, the only PG Batman movies that came out were either attached to a TV show or Lego. What I'm seeing by and large is that Batman movies are made for adult comic book fans. It's not just the rating, there are other tells too. Like the way the movies treat continuity. It's very rare for one of these to continue a story that was left off in a previous movie. Most of them are clearly meant to be enjoyed as standalone stories, yet at the same time they have very little exposition. They always drop you right into the action without doing much to introduce this version of Batman or the Justice League. If there's an obscure hero or villain that pops up, the story will keep moving without bothering to explain who they are as if they assume you already know them. It's an experience not unlike, say, picking up a random comic book, despite not having access to the issues that came before it, or so I've been told. I was lucky enough to have grown up with a passing knowledge of DC characters, so I was able to understand most of what I saw, but the vast majority of these are not newcomer friendly. 
This trend is more common in the animated movies than the live action ones. The live action movies are made for general audiences who aren't familiar with DC, so they're more self-contained. The Nolan trilogy is a good example. The Dark Knight is, for a lot of people, the first or even the only Batman movie they see. It's good, but it's not representative of the Batman franchise. It's very serious, and it tones down or cuts out any element of Batman that's silly or convoluted. And the whole trilogy is a self-contained story that takes the time to set up its own world. It's the Batman that people watch if they don't want something too comic booky. You know, now the DCEU movies finally make a lot of sense to me. In the past decade, comic books have gone mainstream, and general audiences aren't afraid to dive into more complex stuff. When these first started coming out, I know I wasn't the only one who wondered things like, why did they do a Superman movie and then jump right into Batman vs Superman? And then a Justice League movie without an Aquaman, Flash, or Cyborg solo movie? At the time, I just assumed that they were rushing things to catch up with Marvel, but no. They're just copying the approach they've been using for their animated movies, throwing you in and assuming you'll be able to catch up based on your prior knowledge. That approach hasn't worked too well. But if you look online, there's one group of people who really responded well to these. The die-hard comic book fans. Like, take the shot in Batman v Superman. A common complaint about this movie is that it was rushed and nobody really gets proper characterization. But if you've seen a red under the red hood, this shot tells you everything you need to know about this version of Batman. It lets you fill in almost all the gaps in Batman's backstory with those of the previous versions of him you've already seen. All of this is interesting, yes, but it's hardly the most important element in judging what makes a Batman movie good. When making a Batman movie, the most critical thing that you have to get right is the tone. See, in a lot of ways, Batman as a concept is a contradiction. On one hand, he's dark, gritty, with a tortured past, and his stories take direct inspiration from noir, hard-boiled detective stories. But on the other hand, he's a guy in a ridiculous outfit who beats up bad guys in equally ridiculous outfits, and regularly does completely impossible things. These stories are always, on some level, inherently kooky and unrealistic. The best Batman movies are the ones that strike a balance between the two. A movie can work anywhere on this spectrum. On either end, we have the Adam West Batman and the Nolan trilogy, full silly and full serious respectively. And square in the middle, we have the animated series and Mask of the Phantasm. It doesn't matter which angle you take, but the best Batman movies know where they are on the spectrum and stick to it. The worst movies are the ones that flip-flop. In Batman and Robin, for example, they give Mr. Freeze the tragic backstory from the animated series, where his motivation is finding a cure for his frozen wife. My passion thoughts for my bride alone. But then he also has lines like these. Your emotions make you weak. That's why this day is mine. <laughs> and in The Killing Joke, you have all these classic family-friendly Batman tropes mixed with violent and disturbing imagery, and it's just uncomfortable. For a Batman story to work, it has to understand this dichotomy and use that knowledge to keep its tone consistent. It's time for my final recommendations. Which Batman movies do I think you should watch? I'm going to break it into groups, because for a lot of them, your enjoyment will really depend on how much you already know about Batman. For someone who's a total newbie who barely knows what Batman is, stick mostly to the live-action ones. Watch the Adam West Batman and the Nolan trilogy. And also, the animated series and Mask of the Phantasm. If you're a more seasoned Batman fan, definitely check out Under the Red Hood, Year One, Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, and the Lego Batman movie. If you've been around the block a few times and you're itching to see a new unique take, Watch The Dark Knight Returns, The Damian Wayne Trilogy, and Batman Ninja. And if you're interested in the Justice League or broader superhero stuff in general, try Crisis on Two Earths, Teen Titans Go to the Movies, and the entire DC AMU, but if I had to pick one, I'd say The Flashpoint Paradox. There's never been a better time to get into Batman than right now. Why? Because 80-90% to 90 of all of this is all in one place, on HBO Max. See, Warner Brothers owns both DC Comics and HBO, so that's where all the Batman content is other than the Adam West Batman, the really obscure stuff, and the brand new stuff. But if you want to dive into Batman, HBO Max is an absolute necessity. What's next for Batman? Next year we're getting another solo Batman movie, The Batman, starring Robert Pattinson. This will not be part of the DCEU. It was going to be a prequel slash origin story to Batman v Superman, but Ben Affleck backed out. Now it's going to be its own thing, and it looks awesome. The DCEU isn't going anywhere though. We've got The Suicide Squad, a solo Flash movie, and Aquaman and Shazam sequels. 
Ben Affleck's future as Batman is uncertain, but we know that he'll at least be in the Flash movie in some capacity. On the animated side of things, the DCAMU is over, so it looks like Warner Brothers is moving to make more standalone Batman movies. Later this year, we're getting Batman Long Halloween, Parts 1 and 2. Batman is great. I thought maybe after watching so many of these movies back to back, I'd be sick of them, but no. If anything, I'm a way bigger fan than before. There are so many different ways to tell a good story with this guy. I can't wait to see which approaches they try next. The hell are you supposed to be? I'm vengeance.